thank you. Uh, but I'm, yes, I'm, I'm no one tonight. I'm just here uh, instead of others. Uh, so I speak for several others now. I speak for Tosh, Natasha Egan, the director of the Museum of Contemporary Photography down the street, which has very nicely co-hosted uh, the event we're having right now together with ourselves. And also I'm here for Dawood Bay, both Tosh and Dawood in the audience uh, from Columbia College the other hosts bringing Dina uh, to visit with you. Uh, I'm here because uh, the David C. and Sarah Jean Ruttenberg Arts Foundation has started a fantastic series that will happen every other year, focusing on younger photographers, and Dina Lawson is the very first of those, and her work is on view, if you haven't seen it, in the modern wing. Uh, and of course, you know the museum is open until 8 o'clock every Thursday, so go uh, take a look there across the way. Uh, I'm standing here wanting to acknowledge Rona Hoffman, uh, Dina's fabulous dealer who has brought the work to the attention of Chicagoans for some years now. Uh, and I am here absolutely instead of Michal Raz Russo, the wonderful curator of the exhibition with Dina, who is at home enjoying much needed rest with her newborn girl. Uh, <clears throat> Dina Lawson has had her work exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art and MoMA PS1 in New York, where she lives, also at the Studio Museum there, uh, and at uh, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia. This is, I believe, Dina's first solo museum exhibition, and we're very happy to have it here. Uh, when she's not making exhibitions. Dina is busy with magazine work and uh, her photographs have been published in the New Yorker and in Time magazine. Uh, but she got to take a year off more or less as a result of winning the prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship in 2013 and that uh, enabled her to travel to Haiti and Jamaica, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Ethiopia. Uh, there's a book circulating now called Photography is Magic, and I think uh, it is absolutely true in your case, Dina. It, is, it, it seems like such a literal image of the world, but it is magical, not only because it can create dreams and imagination, uh, but because of what it takes to work with people to get them to help you create those images, and Dina Lawson does it wonderfully. So please welcome Dina Lawson. Thank you so much um, for having me um, at the Art Institute of Chicago Museum. Normally I don't start a talk out um, with um, thanks to individuals, but I do feel the need to thank a few organizations, including the Davis C. Sarah Jean Foundation, uh, Ruttenberg Arts Foundation, Rona Hoffman Gallery, thank you for supporting me, um, the Guggenheim Foundation and the Art Matters Grant. The reason why I wanted to um, give thanks to those institutions and galleries as I just remember when I was in Penn State in undergrad and I had no money whatsoever and I was trying to do a photo shoot with um, laundry baskets that I bought to make a light um, box and I cut out a hole in the laundry basket and lined it with foil and put fabric on the uh, cover to make my first light box and it started to melt and burn the uh, the laundry basket, but to have the support, the budget to be able to realize a, a wider, broader dream, um, I think is certainly, has certainly helped my journey. So with that said, I just wanted to go back um, to Rochester, which is where I'm from, Rochester, New York. Um, I come from a very large family, particularly on my mother's side. Um, I have seven aunts and four uncles. And um, my, my paternal grandmother, actually, on my father's side, is actually said to have cleaned the house of George Eastman, 
um, the founder of East Makoda Company. And my mom, who is on the far left in the picture with the blonde streak in her hair, um, she's worked at Kodak for 35 years as an administrative assistant. Um, so I definitely feel like there's a legacy. Each generation um, is growing. I also wanted to go back to Rochester because I felt like a huge part of my visual aesthetic stems from family album portraits. This photograph is of my mom reclined in our living room um, in a, a three-bedroom ranch on Waring Road in Rochester, New York. And she made a calendar for my dad um, when they got married. And when they got married, I, was, I have a twin sister. We were approximately nine years old. And her best friend at the time, Carolyn Moore, um, who has since passed away, uh, she went to her best friend and said, oh, I have this great idea. I want to make a calendar for um, Cornelius, my, my father. And so she made this pinup um, calendar as a wedding gift. And my sister and I assisted the shoot. And I remember being crazy jealous of the whole shoot. I don't know if I wanted to be a model or if I wanted to photograph, but I didn't want to just run and fetch uh, different outfits and so forth. And it was so noticeable that my mom was like, Dina, what is the problem? And I just stomped back to my room because I just really wanted to engage. But um, this is the beginning, the plastic on the couches, as you'll see, the elephant in the background, the pose. Um, this was all material for the photographs that become a larger stage. As I mentioned earlier, I'm an identical twin. This is my twin sister, Dana. Um, she has multiple sclerosis. She lives in a hospital in Rochester, New York. And I just felt that I needed to um, briefly talk about how this sort of mirroring happens in my work, which also stems from this very personal um, relationship with my identical twin. Growing up in Rochester with someone who looks completely like you, um, I didn't realize how much you feel like you're one person until I left Rochester. When I was in New York maybe a year ago, um, someone said, twin, hey. And I knew that whoever called my name or whoever said twin, I didn't know them from New York. They, I, they, I had to have known them from either Penn State or Rochester. And sure enough, there was someone who, who we went to college with. But when I grew up in Rochester, I was known as twin, Dana and I, Dina and Dana. Or um, they would either call us twin or Dina Dana is like one name. And I think this sort of, um, this sort of self-questioning um, in terms of identity, who am I in relationship to other, began to grow into this larger question um, culturally um, as a woman, as an African-American woman, as a spiritual being. Um, so. Dana is that point of reference. Going from Rochester and jumping to um, Jamaica, this photograph of Tisha was taken in uh, 2013 in Kingston, Jamaica. And if you think about that earlier picture of my mom, a very similar pose, and I didn't even realize it until after the photograph was made. But Otisha I met on a prior trip to Jamaica. Um, actually, I found myself in Jamaica through another subject who I photographed here in New York, who I met on a train. And she, um, I asked if I could ever accompany her to Jamaica, and she said, sure. And I actually followed her up on that offer and ended up in Jamaica in 2012 and met Otisha, who I did not photograph in 2012, but for some reason, her being just sat with me for a year. And when I returned to Jamaica, I knew I wanted to photograph her. Um, this photograph was taken in a, a mutual friend's apartment where we stayed um, in Portmore, Jamaica. The very end of the shoot, we tried several different poses. I think one of the major um, questions that I have to deal with is how do you continually situate the, the, the body within a rectangle? And how do you continue to redefine what the body can do within a rectangle? And with this shot, I felt like the the dynamic angle of her body, um, juxtaposed with the tiger rug, spoke about the tension between the body and the environment. But it also reminded me of home, even though I was in a foreign landscape. This image is titled um, 
living room, and it was taken in Brooklyn, New York. This is one of the most recent images I made in East New York, um, Brownsville. So up until this moment, I traveled to uh, DR Congo, which I'll talk about, in addition to Haiti, Jamaica, Ethiopia. And I felt like I needed to bring it back home. I needed to bring it um, in my own backyard, so to speak, in Brooklyn. Regardless of where I travel, whether I'm in DR Congo or Haiti or Brooklyn or uh, Providence, Rhode Island, I do feel like I look at the subject in, with a familial gaze. It is about this extension of family. And within, within this photograph, I was thinking about particularly the black family and how um, in American culture and the American landscape, I feel like the black family has been under assault for decades. And part of, I guess, my intention as a photographer was to, to represent, to show union, affinity between man and woman. Um, and so with this image, I, when I asked the subject, the, the model, uh, Misha, I told her I, I wanted her to embrace him, to hug him, almost, almost like he, she owns his body. She is protecting his body. So, that is a, the idea behind this image, but in terms of the process, I think also the process informs the meaning in this photograph. Um, when I met, I'm sorry, when I met Misha, it was at a, um, it was at a fashion show in the neighborhood in Bed-Stuy, and the fashion show was so strange. It was almost like it was trying to be um, cosmopolitan, but it wasn't because it was in Bed-Stuy and it was on the street, and many of the girls didn't have on outfits that were, so to speak, like high-end fashion, but it was about supporting black women in the neighborhood. And Misha was one of the uh, models. And instantly when I saw her, I knew that there was something about her eyes that I wanted to use with this photograph. So when I met Misha, I got her phone number. Um, I asked her to text me pictures of her living room um, and around her apartment that we could possibly use for the shoot. And I also asked her to if she knew of any person that she would feel comfortable posing with. Um, and she mentioned um, Yate. And when she sent me a picture of Yate, I felt he was a little bit too attractive. But at the same time, if she felt that chemistry, I didn't want to interrupt it and say, oh, you should use another less attractive person. <laughs> but <laughs> so. And when we arrived to her apartment, there was no curtain on the window. Um, you can, as you can see by the boxes, she just moved in maybe um, three weeks prior to this photo shoot, so she wasn't fully unpacked. And when I did a test shot, I noticed that the window seemed to interrupt the mood, so I asked her if she had any curtain or anything that we, we could use to cover up the window. And she pulled out this curtain, but she said she didn't have a curtain rod. And I was like, well, do you have duct tape or anything? And when my friend saw this, she's like, girl, you know, we could uh, duct tape the heck out of something and rig it up. And so we just duct taped this um, curtain up, and then it fell down partially. And she's like, oh, that's not going to be in the photo, is it? I'm like, no, don't worry about it. <laughs> but I actually truly believe that it would not be in the photograph. But then when I saw the image on the light box with the <laughs> the tape, I'm like, this has to be in the image. This is part of it. This is making it work, making the photograph work, making life work, making relationships work. In this image, this is titled Funereal Wallpaper, and it was also taken in Kingston, Jamaica. I often felt like a part of the journey was about utopia. I think the reason why I wanted to travel even the idea of being a photographer, this, Matt mentioned uh, photography is magic. Um, there was something about finding a paradise that I kept returning to. And it's interesting that it would uh, resurface in the image of wallpaper at a funeral home, which is almost like a contradiction. But um, it's, a, it's a serenity scene um, for afterlife, I suppose. But then, obviously, the real plants, the artificial plants interrupt uh, this landscape. But there's something about the tension between the wallpaper um, and the texture. And I think this would lead me to how I got to DR Congo. This um, image is just a snapshot I took when I was um, in DR Congo. 
um, at Mama Goma's house, the woman who I stayed with there. And DR Congo, I think, was one of the most difficult places for me to kind of wrap my head around in terms of getting there. Jamaica was good. Um, Ethiopia was fine, even Haiti. But DR Congo, a friend of mine who's Sierra Leone, she said, if you go missing in DR Congo, she's like, no one, no one is going to save your black ass, so you better be careful. And just that idea, Joseph Conrad's The Heart of, the Heart of Darkness, um, the images of Africa that, particularly Congo, even the word Congo and what it conjures up, um, made it very fearful for me psychologically to to go to. And then not, not only that, but then I was thinking, what should I make even when I go to DR Congo? So I thought about it for a while. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to make an image that's the ant antithesis of what I'm so most fearful about. Um, when I go to DR Congo, I'm going to find paradise. And I actually want to reimagine um, Hieronymus Bosch's The Garden of Earthly Delights. And it's so interesting, once I started to think about paradise and finding paradise in this image I had in my mind, and the, it seems like the more I thought about it, I actually willed it into existence. Because when I arrived in DR Congo in a small town called Gimena, this is literally what the landscape looked like. It, it literally looked like a landscape, or a paradise, like the most beautiful, serene place that I've ever been in my entire life. And it was just interesting after all the fearful, you know, um, blockages that I had. And when I arrived in Gemina, it was just extremely beautiful. So when I arrived in Gemina, um, I worked with uh, a friend of mine who helped me to locate two subjects. Sorry, I'm just trying to play this. Okay. We drove around to find um, the idea landscape for the garden image. And it's actually, you know, there's so many beautiful places. How do you decide what is the correct um, place for a rectangle for the garden? And so we searched for a while. Um, and then literally the day before the shoot was supposed to happen, I was supposed to leave to go back to Kinshasa and then go back to New York. And I still hadn't made the picture yet. And I'm like, OK, we really need to buckle down and figure this out. And so we uh, ended up on someone else's property. But the, the landscape was gorgeous. And we asked if we can photograph there. However, the person who owned the property was 30 minutes away, but the chief was um, available. And we talked to the chief. We sat down. We um, exchanged money. And he said, yes, you can use this location for the shoot. So I got my subject, who we found at a local restaurant in Gemina. And I actually ended up using the taxi driver for the male subject in Toto. And so um, when we arrived at the site for the garden, the day of the shoot was maybe um, we got up at 4 in the morning. I wanted it to be sunrise because I wanted the sun to look a certain way. Um, we arrived at the location, and the owner was there. And he looked really perturbed and as if, you know, what are we doing here? And one other thing, too, um, in Gemina, even if it's 4 o'clock in the morning and you think everyone is asleep, as soon as you pull up and you're a foreigner, I swear like 50 people will be behind you wondering like where you, what you're doing. And that is what happened actually. At 5 o'clock in the morning, the whole village was awake. We had like a whole posse behind us following us. And then I heard um, Daniel, who was helping me with the photo shoot, arguing with the uh, person who owned the property. And um, you know, I don't speak Lingala, and I speak a little bit of French, but I do know body language, and I know something is not right. And, um, and I'm like, well, Daniel, the chief is right there. And the chief has a smirk on his face. And, and he's like, they don't respect the chief. And I'm like, what? We just like paid the money. We made this you know, arrangement. And, um, and then next thing you know, the model, she shouts um, something in Lingala. I don't know, understand what she's saying. And then next thing you know, she picks up my camera bag, places it on top of her head, because every, the women carry baskets on their head. But she put this camera bag on her head and just marched off to the car. And I'm like, what is happening, my photo shoot? <laughs> um, and w once we got into the car, 
Um, also, too, I didn't mention she's also on a timeline because she has to go to work at 9 o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, oh, my God, I leave tomorrow. We have not done this shoot. And I started crying, actually, in the back seat. And Daniel's like, OK, we got this American girl in the seat. We need to like make sure this happens. And, um, and Daniel's like, they thought we were there for diamonds. And I'm like, what? They thought, because you know, Daniel actually started to, um, he asked the little boy with the machete to start chopping down the bush, which I didn't tell him to do. But I guess because he started chopping down stuff, they thought we were there to excavate diamonds. And I was like, wow. So, but actually this location that we had scouted earlier on, we returned to and very, we, I had to work very fast and it was mosquitoes and everything. But in this brief moment, um, the two subjects were at one and at peace. They are not actually a couple. This is completely staged. This is in total the subject here. <laughs> but I was thinking again about Congo too. Um, Congo has the second largest river in the world, the Congo River, the deepest river one of the most powerful rivers in Africa. Um, the hydropower can basically power the entire Africa, African continent. Um, I don't know if any of you have read Robert Ferris Thompson's book, um, Flash of the Spirit, but he, I would definitely recommend you read it. He talks about Congo with a K, um, about the mighty Congo, the mighty Congo civilization, um, just, as, just as classical as, say, the Roman civilization or Greek civilization. Um, and about returning to the mother, the motherland, um, the heart of the mother, the center of the continent. And so this image to me is, I guess, um, reclaiming that power, the black, you know, the power of going again back to family relationships, the black body, um, even the skin. The skin in this image is so important. Um, it is said that the melanin in skin has eyes, eyes of memory. Um, and so to me, this is about the primordial, primordial romance, love, and of course, Adam and Eve, and so forth. In 2012, uh, I went to Haiti, and I was interested in voodoo in terms of African spirituality and African American spirituality, and how it fits in the whole cosmological um, realm, and I had the opportunity to witness a ceremony for Ursuli Dantor, and uh, during this ceremony, the head priestess Mambo is mounted by uh, Ursuli uh, Danto. I remember um, as well, as the ceremony was happening, Oops, hold on. Just trying to play. Um, also, Ursuli Danto has the black pig as a representation. Um, different spirits have different animals, but black, the black pig is represented for Ursuli Dantor. Um, during this particular ceremony that I witnessed back in 2012, one of the priestess, when she was possessed by the spirit or mounted by, uh, by the spirit, she picked up the head of the pig and put it on top of her head and began to march around as if she was a queen and empowered. And I remember that image stayed in my mind. I was too afraid to get up close to photograph it, but, I, but um, it stayed with me for about a year. And I knew that I had to return to Haiti to try to remake that image. And so that's what I did. In 2013, I went back with a friend, Henry Taylor. And I met with Claude, who helped me with the photo shoot. And I said, for this trip, I want to photograph such and such. And he looked at me. We were having drinks at a bar. And he just kind of ignored me. And I was like, actually, no, I'm serious. Like, I, I need to make this picture. But before I landed in Haiti, Often, um, I work with a collaborator, collaborator, Aaron Gilbert. He's a painter. Sometimes I ask him to sketch out drawings for me in advance. And I ask him to draw for me an image of a woman um, with a pig on her head. 
and he initially drew this for me. <laughs> and this is the day before I fly out to Haiti. I'm like, Aaron, please stop playing around. I have to go. <laughs> and then he really drew the picture for me. And this picture became, um, I feel like once, when I have a picture drawn, it actually helps me to make the photo shoot happen. And I think the subjects trust me more. They, be, you know, they, if they can see it in a drawing, I feel like they understand what I'm trying to do. And for me to say that I want to have this done, I sound crazy, but if you see it, a drawing of it, you can kind of see the spirit of what I'm trying to do. And so when I got to Haiti, this is one of the first times where I had to work with a subject who I couldn't meet until the day of the shoot. And this particular subject was waiting for me. I remember when I initially walked into the room, she was scared. She thought I was there to do black magic. And I showed her my contact sheet book. And after she saw my work, I think she understood what I was trying to do. Also, Henry, the painter friend, and her drank a little bit of rum. And I think she relaxed. But I told her not to drink too much rum. But as you can see, even here, um, even when I feel like I'm out of my realm, culturally, socially, because I didn't grow up within voodoo, but I st still felt the need to um, have a directorial hand in staging the event, like applying the lipstick. I wanted to pick out the clothing, but they told me she had to wear blue and red because those are Ursula Dantour's colors. The day of the shoot was just one of the craziest shoots I've ever had. Hold on one second, let me just. I feel like the video speaks for itself, so let me just. Can you do this, Tom? Can you film this? You think my camera's okay? Um, so with As Above, So Below, um, it was interesting to think about how I was appropriating, I guess, voodoo for um, this photograph. In a sense, I felt like the, the photography act in of itself became a ceremony, so to speak. The fact that, um, number one, she's wearing Ursula Dantor's colors, which was they, the, the folks that were helping me um, insisted that she wear these colors. Um, <laughs> But at this, I think most importantly, what I want to say about this image is, for me, it conjured back notions of the revolution in Haiti. Um, it conjured notions of loss for the transatlantic slave trade. But it also, um, to me, represents uh, supernatural power, um, this ability to, to succeed or this ability to um, thrive um, based off of different levels of capture and so forth. But with this image, with this next video, I wanted to just briefly let um, another Mambo priestess who I know in Harlem, her name is Mambo Devoti Desir. 
um, give a little bit more context to what we've seen, because I feel like it could be that image in particular, and also the video could almost be shock value, but I feel like um, Mambo Duwoti Desir, who is also a voodoo priestess, um, who is Haitian, I feel like she contextualizes um, the role of voodoo in, in a wider context. Voodoo is often defined as a funk word that means a sacred dance or dance to the ancestors. Um, and we can stick with that definition. It's an appropriate one, it's a correct one, but it begs that we go a little bit further um, because the nature of the dance uh, isn't simply what we see in, in ceremonies where we're actually dancing. Um, but the dance is also the manifestation of ancestral energy. It's the manifestation of divine energy within oneself. Um, so when we see people in states of grace, uh, what others might refer to as possession, that is a manifestation of the dance. That is a manifestation of, of divine energy working its way through our, our flesh and bone. Voodoo, for me, is that. Um, but I would define it in more broader terms, in terms uh, as it being an, an eco-theological uh, discipline. It's more than just a religion. It is, it's, a, it's a philosophy. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a way of being in the world and perceiving the world um, that encourages us to honor and respect the physical environment that we're in, honor and respect each other, uh, honor and respect ourselves, because we as individuals are the, the culmination of many others who came before us. Therefore, to honor and respect ancestors and uh, or ancestral knowledge, and put it that way. There are some ancestors that do not need to be honored and respected. You know, let's be clear about that. Um, we're humans, therefore we make mistakes. We don't need to honor and respect mistakes. We don't need to honor and respect wrong. Um, but we do need to honor and respect the knowledge that comes out of uh, our trials and tribulations, our, uh, our acts of submission, our acts of resistance um, as human beings. Uh, so that's how I would define Voodoo as, again, an eco-theological tradition that encourages us to maintain kinship ties between this, the, the living and the unliving, uh, between the, the visible world and the invisible world, uh, between ourselves and what one would define as God. Um, for the record, I don't necessarily define God, and I can, I'm saying I, in this case, not we, mm -hmm. uh, because I can't say that all the some perceive the divine as I do this way. But as a, as a priest of Dambala, and that we do the two serpents that hold the world together, I, I view God as this, as energy that has connected the lives of various people together. Um, energy that hopefully culminates in goodness, energy that hopefully manifests itself in love. Um, but that energy can also manifest itself in a state of uh, imbalance, if you will. And that produces chaos. Um, but then when we find ourselves in these chaotic states, we, we have to summon energies back, pull these things back so that we, we are in a place of balance. Um, and that too, I talked about the dance. The dance, that too is part of the, the dance that we engage in. Um, did uh, voodoo, if at all, play any role in the revolution? The Haitian revolution uh, was officially marked by the ceremony and the Congress of Bois-Caïma. I say the Congress of Bois-Caïma because um, 
And Camp Purdue is, is a discipline. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, enslaved Africans to come together, make decisions, you're starting a revolution. It's not just something that you do spur of the moment. The same way that one doesn't decide to have a ceremony spur of the moment, it is something that requires a tremendous amount of thought and coordination and, and networking and pulling together of resources. Um, so the Haitian Revolution uh, in August uh, 1791, uh, well, is believed to have officially started. I can, can contend that it actually started before um, with the ceremony of Bakaima. And uh, yes, and so Voodoo was very much a part of that. And uh, Ezuli Banto, who this uh, priest actually represents or is the embodiment of, um, and we know this. First and foremost, because of the colors, the colors of her dress, red and, um, well, blue and red, which are Dantor's colors. And then she has the black pig on her head. Um, and and this, the black pig or the black boar was believed to, is what is traditionally sacrificed, offered to Dantor. Um, Dantor being, the queen mother, Dantor being the mother uh, of the nation, um, Dantor being that model of, of, of womanhood, if you will, um, who's got you know, swag, like you wouldn't believe. You know, this is the mother who you touch her child. This is what happens to you, all right? Um, this is the, the notion of Africa. Um, and, and I would say African um, spiritual energy and power that was not going to succumb, was not going to submit to European uh, constructs of God and, their, and, uh, and supremacy. Um, and in this case, I do mean supremacy in terms of white supremacy. Um, but more importantly, I mean supremacy in terms of notions of the divine. You know, that Ibrahimic tenets of, of God um, that would define who was human and who was not, was not going to surpass and exceed African notions of supremacy and who's divine and who's human, or what is divine and what is human. I know I, that was a long clip, but I felt like um, her idea of um, African cosmology is really important for my work. Um, what she particularly said about returning to the mother, um, about Ursula Danto being the mother of Haiti, and if you touch her child, what will happen to you? And, and thinking earlier what I said about Congo, the center of Africa, the mother, and then this photograph, literally, personally, my mother um, in the living room, um, which was an inspiration for the next photograph, Mother Tongue, which was a, the, show, the title of my last show at Rona Hoffman Gallery. Um, this image was made also in Haiti during the same time. And above her head is Ursula Freda, another manifestation of Ursula Danto. Um, but yes, yeah, she's the more sensual, sexual element of Ursula. Um, we know that it's Ursula Freda because she's a light-skinned woman. Um, with her, the animal is the white chicken. Her colors are light blue and light pink. Um, and below, um, I met this uh, model. Her name is Juriana. We were at a bar, and I just really loved her bangs. And I thought she would... Um, be really interesting to photograph. I had no idea what I was going to do. Sometimes I have a preconceived notion of how I'm going to pose the subject. I didn't have any idea until we actually got to the hotel, to my hotel room. This is actually the room that I stayed in. And um, I remembered the photograph that my mom made, and I wanted to mimic her um, sticking her tongue out. This is an earlier work. This is way before Guggenheim, way before um, I started to travel. This was made in 2008 in uh, Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, 
but it goes back to Rosalie Danto, the mother, the fierce mother. What I love about this photograph, this is titled Wanda and Daughters, um, is the fear, fierceness of Wanda, the jewelry, but at the same time, clearly the act of love, the fact that she would adorn her children's hair, the amount of barrettes and beads. When, when my friend saw this photograph, she said you could tell that she loves her daughters because the way she decorates her hair. And I just love the, um, the two sides of the coin here, the fierceness of Wanda, but also this gentle um, nature of a mother and woman. And I find that even myself trying to walk that balance in life as a woman, as a mother, and so forth. This was taken um, near the A train by the Utica Ave stop at the park. Hellshire Beach Tile was taken in Jamaica. There's a beach in Jamaica called Hellshire Beach, and mostly locals go to this particular beach. And there's many fish, sac fish shacks around. And I was waiting for um, steamed fish and dumplings to cook. And I noticed a woman laying on this mat watching TV, lounging. And I took a few pictures of her. And she got up and walked away. And she left this imprint in the towel. And I just noticed the flies swarming around the towel. And it was just a spontaneous photograph with my medium format and flash um, camera. Recently, I did an interview with Henry Taylor in Bomb Magazine, and he talked about this image in terms of the negative space, um, formally, and um, how often I try to get everything into a picture, but sometimes it's good to just fall back and let the landscape breathe a little bit. So I love how it refers to the body without the body actually being present. This is another image taken in the same hotel in Haiti. It's called Olufsen Storage Room. And I happened to walk by the storage room area and knew I wanted to use it, the location. The sculpture above her head is of Dessaline, which was one of the revolutionaries during the Haitian Revolution. Mama Goma, this picture is um, was inspired by another photograph I saw online of a young woman with a prom dress on, with the same identical prom dress. Um, and I just loved how strange it looked. It was kitschy, but it was strange at the same time, and I wanted to emulate that. So when I went to DR Com Congo, um, I had this picture also with me. And when I arrived to, DR to Gemina, the small town, um, Mama Goma, who was the mother of the house that I stayed in, she had the subject waiting for me to photograph. She had a seamstress there to meet me. We made the dress. She made the dress. She was amazing in two days. And um, I photographed her in the living room. At night, I remember I, I was sleeping in the mosquito net, the mosquito net I showed you earlier on. And um, at night, I would wake up and. Two times it happened, there was a, a, like a big flying roach in my mosquito. And like I woke up um, and made a loud noise. By the way, there's, so it's Mama Goma, her husband, and her two daughters all in this small house. And I was just making all this noise in the back at like 1 o'clock in the morning. And Mama Goma came in and was like, what's the problem? And I'm like, oh, it's a big mosquito in my, or not a mosquito, a big flying roach in my um, mosquito net. And she'd be like, OK, let me get the broom. You go out in the other room and stay there. But um, she was just an amazing woman, person. But her name is not actually, uh, the woman's name of the house is Mama Goma, but that is not her name. But I felt like it was fitting for the dress and the occasion. And I think I was also conjuring up my own pregnancy with this picture a year later. This is driving around in, in uh, Gemina. We ran out of gas, and we were waiting to get more gas, and I just saw this couple ride by. Jonet I met on, a tra on the A train in Brooklyn. This was taken in 2013, I believe. 
and she was sitting across from me. She had on fuchsia from head to, to head to toe. She had on fuchsia eyelashes, fuchsia nails, fuchsia jewelry, everything fuchsia. Her daughter sitting next to her also was adorned with fuchsia. And I was totally drawn to her and wanted to ask the photographer, but I was really nervous because I hate to approach people on the train. I feel more comfortable um, approaching someone on the street or in the supermarket, but on the train in, in New York, it just people could be strange or think that you're crazy. But I just could not help myself with Jonette. So I just simply got up, worked up my nerve, sat next to her and said, you have a very interesting look. I would love to photograph you. And she had her headphones on and she took them off and I said it again. And she said, I heard you the first time. <laughs> and, and I asked her for a phone number and we exchanged numbers. This is actually the second photo shoot. We've done total, in total three photo shoots together. The first photo shoot was at her house in her apartment in Canarsie. And it was of her and her daughter. It was a wider shot, an environmental portrait. But I felt like with Jonette, I didn't want, I, I really felt like her body, her skin, her t um, three quarters of her body was really the landscape that I wanted. And so I arranged to do a studio shoot, which I rarely do. And thinking about her skin tone, I ordered a light brown backdrop to um, blend in with her skin tone. I knew she loved blonde hair, so I went to the, um, one of the stores on Fulton. There's so many beauty salons on Fulton Avenue, Fulton Street in Brooklyn. And I bought uh, more blonde hair, and she brought her jewelry. And I think this is about excess, but also coming from Haiti, like I had done this shoot maybe like a month after I came back from Haiti. I think Haiti and the aesthetic, the visual aesthetic of sequence and <coughs> the way bottles are adorned, and um, it was all material, uh, visual material in my mind that I wanted to emulate with Jonette. And when she saw the photograph afterwards, um, oftentimes I, like, I don't know what the subject is gonna think about their image, so I get very nervous about what they're gonna say. Um, and I don't think this is the most flattering image of Jonette. I don't think I take very flattering pictures of people. Um, in general, but she felt like, she said, there's a part of me that you capture, you capture my spirit. And she loved the photograph and I was like, I felt so good, I was really surprised. Um, so. <coughs> Emily and daughter was an appropriated image. Uh, when my son was born back in 2000 and uh, two. He was premature and I stayed at the Ronald McDonald House for two months. And Emily was also at the Ronald McDonald House because her daughter um, had an unusual disease um, that could not be treated in Jamaica. She's from Jamaica. And we um, developed a close friendship. However, I lost touch. I don't know her number. I have no idea how to get in contact with her. But when we left um, the Ronald McDonald House, she gave me this small image, maybe like three inches by four inches as a memento mori. And I had it in my, um, my little box for years, but I just kept staring at it throughout the years. And I'm like, wow, this is so interesting. What would happen if I blew it up? So finally I decided to blow it up. And I don't know, just like the photographers, I think I definitely have, um, some photographers don't obsess about the print. Like I remember Diane Arbus says she doesn't care about the print, it's more about the image. But I think there's a part of me that really does get into that. And when this, when the, when I blew up the print, the texture, it was just so violent. Um, the dust and the scratches and the digital moiré. But then it, it also brought back memories of like um, photo studios in Rochester and like images that my friends would have um, that we would exchange in high school. Um, so I guess I was drawn to the strangeness of this image. Kingdom Come is an image that was made in Ethiopia. I knew I wanted to use two younger uh, individuals to represent Ethiopian royalty. When I've seen images of Haile Selassie or Empress Zauditu um, and their majestic attire, I think it's just 
um, supernatural, beautiful. And I wanted to think about um, this future generation of the, this future generation and what is capable. And so also thinking about Ethiopia in terms of its relationship to Jamaica um, and how many um, Rastafari and Sihali Selassie is almost basically a god. And I wanted to use that, those ideas of Hali Selassie, the fact that Ethiopia was um, the only country in Africa to not be colonized by Europeans, um, to me represents a, a power that I wanted to capitalize. So we, I found these two subjects at a local YMCA in Addis Ababa. And we scouted for these traditional robes that are worn during wedding ceremonies. Um, and also royalty wears the, this particular robe as well. We went to a jewelry shop. I found the Star of Davids, um, which often Holly Selassie would have these medallions um, in, in the image. I remember images of Holly Selassie with these big lions. And there was something mag uh, magnetic about him. Um, and with, with, this, with this image, I remember I met another young girl who I actually really wanted to be the star image of this photograph. However, she never left a phone number. And so this young, the other young woman was the second choice. But I'm really happy because there's something about her eyes um, that I don't think the first subject had. So it's interesting how you, you're given a certain subject to work with and it actually turns out to be more than what you imagine. This is Qaddafi. I found this image on the cover of a Feds magazine and um, Qaddafi was a drug lord in the Bahamas and I just love his swag. I love the Mercedes-Benz car and I love to compare royalty um, the amount of chains, this particular pose, which I feel like is definitely more of a black male pose, um, I thought was just beautiful. I'm not sure how much time I have, but um, this is Juve. It's photographed during um, a West Indian Day Parade in Flatbush, Brooklyn. It's traditionally a Trinidadian um, festival. The day is coming. And powder is thrown in the air. I tried to photograph this twice, two years in a row, and I would end up falling asleep and not waking up in time. But finally, I stayed up. And another woman was supposed to come with me, and she bailed at the last minute. So I'm like, all right, fine. I'll just go by myself. I put a plastic bag over my camera and just walked around. And I love that this conjures up celebration, um, partying, but also the, the powder is also, uh, reminds me of magic and the divine as well. This is one of the few images too that has, you know, the black male body in, in the image and I feel like I wanted to see that body in this particular image. So, three women, New Orleans. This is taken on a road trip with a good friend of mine, Dana Brown. Um, I've known Dana since I've since we were in third grade in Rochester, New York. And interestingly enough, I'm working on an assignment now. Um, and she's working with me on this particular assignment for a magazine. But we're mimicking the same strategies we have used during our three road trips together in the past. It is actually 7 o'clock. So I think I'm going to conclude this talk here. Um, but I'll open it up for questions. Do you have any questions? Thanks.